So it's my privilege to officially open the conference by introducing our keynote speaker, Dr. Gerald Baldwin. Dr. Baldwin is a research geophysicist and a chief scientist of the U.S. Geological Survey's Western Remote Sensing and Visualization Center and is the assistant hazard coordinator for the Pacific Southwest area. His research group's focus is to detect, measure, map, I can't read my notes. <laughs> um, to, to map, analyze, surface change deformation associated with earthquakes, fluid production, debris flows, floods, fires, dam failures, mine collapses, glaciers, and other natural and anthropogenic hazards by utilizing geodetic techniques such as ground-based tripod LIDAR, GPS, leveling, airborne LIDAR, and satellite interferometric synthetic aperture radar. His keynote presentation today is titled Ultra-High Resolution, Three- and Four-Dimensional Point Cloud Analysis Spanning the Earth's Sciences. Please welcome me, welcome and joining Dr. Gerald Baldwin. Thank you. I'm honored to um, be asked to give the keynote at uh, this meeting. The, the field of geodesy has significantly changed in the last 25 years. When I was an undergraduate, I'd go out um, doing leveling, triangulation, trilateration across the San Andreas Fault and other air, uh, active faults in Southern California. At the end of the day, we'd have a handful of data points collected. Then GPS came along. And with the GPS, we were able to get very dense time series at individual points, or with RTK and GPS, we were able to go out and collect hundreds of data points within an hour, no, within a day. And then we had um, grant, no, airborne LIDAR. Airborne LIDAR allowed us to go ahead and start collecting spatially significant areas, start looking at topography, land surface change, and I'll just say really put the topographic map on steroids. We're able to start addressing a new suite of questions with it. Ground-based LIDAR is another step up in data density in small areas. Uh, my first laser scanner, I could do 2,000 points per second. So over a five-second period, I could collect 10,000 points, basically one centimeter spa spacing. And at the time, it was amazing. It would take, how long would it take a graduate student with RTK GPS to go out and measure 10,000 points? Better part of a week. And I was able to do that in five seconds. Now, as part of this point cloud revolution, I can now collect just shy of five million data points in that five second time period. So the talk that I'm gonna uh, cover in front of you, we'll, we'll be spending a fair amount of time looking at ground-based LiDAR. And also, I want to interject at times some of the different challenges that we have as technology evolves. So the challenge that I had back when I was initially doing leveling work, collecting um, data across the faults, is, well, I did all the calculations by hand. So it was all done by hand. And the CPU crash would be associated with the number of margaritas that I had the night before. And nowadays, the CPUs crash because I've got that five billion data points that I collect in five seconds. And so we're able to really start addressing new suites of scientific questions with the technology. Um, I'll have to apologize for having to skip through multiple sections of my uh, talk. My uh, presentation is approximately 10 gigabytes in size, so I've had to break it down to smaller chunks so that we can go ahead and have more smoother uh, visualization of our viewing of it. Let's dive in. Uh, what I'm going to first do is we'll start off uh, here in uh, Florida, and I'm going to take us off to Parkfield, California. Using Google Earth, we're located here, and I'll go ahead and start flying across the country, and any of the lines that you start seeing on here other than county lines are faults. I'm going to first start talking about the, Grand, uh, the San Andreas Fault, because I took delivery of my first laser scanner on a Monday. Who cares? Well, it happened the next day was a Parkfield earthquake in Southern California. I've been an earthquake geophysicist, and this was an earthquake that the USGS had predicted, and 
and it never came. Well, it didn't never come. It, it just came significantly right, 12 years later than what we had anticipated. So this here is the San Andreas Fault, running right up through here. And this is the Parkfield Bridge, of which we'll spend a fair amount of time with. So with it, again, here's the, the San Andreas. We have right lateral strike slip um, motion on it. We've had occurrence of an earthquake in magnitude 6 roughly every 22 years, so 1857 all the way down to 1966. And then if we add on another 22 years, well, you'd expect it to happen in 1988, but it didn't take place then. And it didn't take place for another 12 years. The reason is we didn't understand the Earth's dynamics well enough. There was an earthquake not too far away called the Kalinga earthquake, and it, effect it effectively clamped the fault. It made it effectively squeeze down tighter, and it took a lot longer to go ahead and uh, overcome that. And we eventually had the earthquake. So I went down there the day after the earthquake. So here's the view. The earthquake originated just south of here where the arrow's looking down. We actually thought it was going to originate up uh, further to the north. And so I went down, set up my instrument here, and scanned the bridge. And here's what uh, one of the scans. So I scanned it from that side, and then I scanned it uh, from this side. I don't know how many people are familiar with ground-based LIDAR, so let me quickly explain the technology. It's active source. It's very much like taking a floodlight. So if I shine a floodlight out over the audience, there are going to be shadows. And so what I have to do is actually pick the instrument up, move it over a bit further, and do another scan. And by having scans from multiple locations, you're able to go ahead and stitch together a complete three-dimensional image. This laser scanner, and there are a number of different types out there, but this scanner goes horizontally, back and forth, and I slowly image up the target. And so here's what a ground-based LiDAR scan looks like. This is the Parkfield Bridge heading across through here, about four millimeter spot spacing right about this distance out on the, on the bridge. And so with that, where I had to go ahead and relocate the instrument, these are the number of different setups that I had uh, throughout the time. In this 2005 survey, seven setups, 33 scans, 20.9 million data points. At the time, this was a huge data set. I now collect that much in about 25 seconds. But it's still an incredible data set, and there's a lot that we were able to work with it. So how does the San Andreas work through here? The San Andreas main fault straight as splay comes right up through here. The bifurcates right under the bridge here, and we actually could see differential motion on there. So what I'd like you to do is go ahead and put on your 3D glasses. Whenever you see this logo on any of the images, it means that it is a, a graphic that does work with 3D. Um, Due to motion parallax, you don't necessarily have to have the glasses on. And here we go. We're going to start off looking across the bridge. So here's the bridge. It's three-dimensional data, so I'm able to go underground. So we're now under the ground looking uh, beneath at the, uh, the, the engineered structures. This is not penetrating beneath the ground. We're just able to view structures from different perspectives. You notice the bridge, how it's not straight across, where there's actually a bend across the San Andreas. We could also take a look at these Big support columns here, here, here. They form a nice line, and then all of a sudden they're offset right up there. We're going to slowly work our way across the bridge and I'm going to identify a few key things that we'll be referencing later on. Again, looking down the, the bridge and the guardrail, you can see how the deck of the bridge is clearly curved. These structures here are offset. These support columns, they're basically two-foot diameter concrete structures. And what's really nice about them is I can fit mathematical primitives to those and identify the center of these structures. So let's take a look underneath at one of these structures. You can also see here's the guardrails through here. So very nice cylinder. So this is taken from a couple different angles and everything was stitched together. You could look at the offset. Here's the structures here. That's offset, that's offset. Those lines over here, those are cars driving by, and so the bright spots are actually uh, license plates. The grayscale on here is the infrared albedo. It's the reflective properties um, in uh, this instrument here is a 1400 nanometer. 
And so we're able to look at the albedo. So things like license plates show up really bright. Um, this white paint on here is uh, very bright. Uh, we got street signs, we got fence posts. I'm going to show later on in, in graphics that we're actually able to track the three dimensional positional change with those um, features following the earthquake. So the next image I'm going to show you is a difference plot where I've taken the data that was collected the day after the earthquake with data that was collected 10 weeks later. I held this part of the, the bridge fixed and allowed this side to float. So if the bridge did not move in the following uh, 10 weeks after the earthquake, the difference plot would show no change. And so it would be, and the color palette that I'm using, it will basically be green. But if you do see any colors whatsoever, that means there's been change in the following days. So again, next plot's going to be from the, this view, and we're going to look right through here. OK, nice crescendo. Um, here's, uh, this is held fixed. We've got green. Looks like our uh, projector is just slightly off uh, the screen, but gr green right here is zero. As we come, here's this, uh, three, uh, the first four support structures. Then all of a sudden, we hit red right here, where we're seeing in the neighborhood of seven centimeters. You also look out here where you've got fence posts and signs. They're all moving, and we're able to track that. If we take the, um, from September 2004 to the July 2005, we can start seeing added color. We could also see how the bridge response in here. And again, we're actually seeing colors with um, the fence post. The wonder, I mean, what's great about this data, it's three-dimensional, and I'm able to look at it from all different perspectives. So what I'd like to do is take a look looking straight down at the support column. Here's the point cloud data set that was collected right after the earthquake. There's the center's uh, support column. Here's the guardrail, and here's the edge. What I'm able to do is fit a mathematical primitive to the point cloud. On the, I have on the order of 10 to 20,000 data points through there. I know what the diameter is. It's a two-foot two diameter. I'm able to go ahead and just do a regression, do a best fit, and able to nail the center of that cylinder down to the millimeter level. And so you've got a cylinder. The center of a cylinder is a vector. Where the vector meets a plane, say the deck of the uh, bridge, you have a point. This is a unique three-dimensional point that I'm able to go ahead and track over time. So that's what we're going to do. Here's the, the cylinder from uh, the day after the earthquake. There's 10 weeks later. And we're able to come in and measure the displacement. So here's uh, 27, oh, sorry, um, 7.1 centimeters worth of uh, displacement. We take a next step further into March. We have 2.6 centimeters with a grand total of 9.1 centimeters worth of displacement in the 23 weeks following the earthquake. So if we've got this much displacement, what's going on actually with the bridge itself? This is the support column, so it's anchored deep into the earth. And so as we look at one of these displacement plots, we're seeing a fair amount of displacement through here. Uh, this little patch of red right here, we actually have a small little uh, pull-apart basin. That area's dropped down about three centimeters during this time period. The blue that we're seeing here are geogeeks. We're going down to take a look at what's going on with the bridge, and that's us walking on the grass, uh, pushing it down. And so here's a map, uh, here's an image showing, here's where the faults come together, and that's where this area is just dropping down. In days of old, with doing traditional GPS or leveling triangulation, a feature like this would be completely missed, because it's too small. We'd actually have to use sampling maybe at a 10 centimeter level to even see this. And so the, the technology is allowing us to address new questions. So let's go in and take a look at the bridge. Here's a, an inset with about one millimeter spot spacing. We're able to see the bolts and structures. So what is going on between that interface? Here's the concrete. Here's the bridge. It's sitting on a sheet of rubber. The sheet of rubber very much looks like a radial tire, and it's sliding along. So it's called base isolation. The deck of the bridge is isolated from the base, and as the ground moves underneath, the top is able to go ahead and slide uniformly along, leaving a skid mark. And here's the skid mark. Here's where the bridge had been sitting for the last decade, and here's where it is now. So we're able to go in and uniquely measure that, and what we find is 10.4 centimeters, or four and a half inches worth of displacement in the 23 weeks uh, following the earthquake. Well. In my earlier slide, I showed there was 9.1 centimeters of displacement, but this is showing 11.4. So what's the difference? The difference is, if I had the foresight when I got the instrument on the Monday to drive down to Parkfield and scan the bridge, I'd have my uh, 
face on the cover of Science or Nature because I would have captured the earthquake. Instead, I went down there the day after, and so what that extra 2.3 centimeters of motion represents is the co-seismic and the immediate day of post-seismic deformation on the bridge. So without knowing what the co-seismic was, I was able to go back and back calculate it. Caltrans, California Department of Transportation released a report saying there's one inch of motion at the bridge, one inch is 2.5 centimeters, so we agree within two millimeters. So let's take a look at that data set. Go ahead and put the 3D glasses back on. And we have three different colors in here. We have white, yellow, and blue. White's the original data. And I think we go yellow is the second, and then blue is the last uh, time period. And so with the animation, we've got a very good alignment, very good agreement. We're starting off with the support structure where um, uh, we held fixed. Now you can go ahead and see these offsets through here. We're going to zoom into the deck of the bridge where we are going to make it life size or a little bit larger than life size to take a look at the alignment on the deck of the bridge. This area here, if we've got a really good alignment, all the, point, all the colors should be uniquely on top of each other, which they are. As we come through here, you don't see any separation. So what this means is we can go ahead and believe the data that we're going to see coming up. What we're going to do is we're going to follow this I-beam that's underneath the bridge. Right here, all the colors are intermingled. And as soon as we come to an expansion joint mid-bridge, they're actually going to start separating out. And what you'll end up seeing is uh, to the left, you're going to see a very faint gray. Then we'll see the yellow and the blue as this I-beam, which is connected to each of the different uh, support structures, is bent as the bridge is deforming and accommodating the, the post-seismic deformation. We'll go ahead and take a look down again at the support column. See the three different time periods. You can see the, the, the offset of each of the different, uh, uh, the center of the cylinders. So it's something you could actually go ahead and slowly eat popcorn and slowly watch it move along. We'll also see the embankment where uh, the bridge attaches to uh, the other side of the riverbank, and it is also offset. Here's looking down. All the light, fuzzy stuff up here is grass or uh, weeds. What's interesting is ground based lidars, it's scalable just like airborne lidar. Okay, we've got, you can see the offsets through there, guardrail. Here's just fence posts from a barbed wire fence. And we're going to be coming up to some more fence posts. A street sign that's basically at the top has got the cross. And from that, I'm able to fit best fit primitives to each of the different planes, the intersection of two planes. So fit a plane here, fit a plane there. The intersection is a vector where it meets a point. Say the ground is a unique point that I'm able to track. Here's a chain link fence. And so I'm able to go back or go forward and start collecting geodetic data over a huge number of data points. This Jim Lincap or USGS collecting a few data points going across. This is old school triangulation. It's a long-term uh, network they have, and he was there collecting data on a single point. So that's effectively old school, and what we're showing here now is the new school. Not everything that um, moved in or changed in Parkfield was associated with the earthquake. We actually had a flood that came down and completely exposed the land surface. So here's the original land surface for the first two time periods, and you can see with the blue here where to read it out. So go ahead and take off the glasses. So why is this important? Um, I, there is a rumor that California has a few faults, and we do. And those faults produce a fair amount of uh, shaking potential. And so all the areas in red, which kind of match uh, where all the faults are, is where you have uh, a, ch a chance for having infrastructure damage. And then when you superimpose on, I'll say, a AAA roadmap of California, you can see we have a lot of main infrastructure that is in, um, I'll say, harm's way of um, shaking. And what type of uh, issues do we have that come from that? Uh, the last World Series that the Giants did not win, um, uh, the Bay Bridge uh, series here, the Bay Bridge fell down. You got the um, Northridge earthquake, Landers earthquake, Kern County earthquake, Landers, Northridge. 
Um, and this is from the San Fernando earthquake where we almost had a dam failure with it. So ground-based LIDAR, especially when integrated with uh, GPS, INSAR, and airborne LIDAR, you're able to have some very dense data sets that are incredibly valuable for looking at tectonic processes. What we saw with the, par uh, in the Parkfield earthquake were things that we never thought possible, all due to the very dense point cloud data set. Now I'm going to as quickly switch gears to take a look at levee stability. And very timely with regard to um, the way we had a levee failure um, yesterday, uh, or maybe it was early this morning um, with uh, Sandy. The Corps of Engineers is working on, uh, they want to remove all trees on all levees or within 15 feet of levees across the United States to be FEMA certified. And this is following Katrina, and it'll be interesting to see how things um, continue on uh, following Sandy. Uh, this is a slurry wall, which is a concrete bentonite mixture, where we actually have tree roots that penetrated through these. And so the, the quarters of engineers' concern is actually that tree roots may cause problems. We also have ground squirrel burrows that are in there. So we've done a lot of different uh, projects over the last couple of years with the Sacramento Area County Flood Control Authority, Corps of Engineers, UC Berkeley, UC Davis, and we've done a number of studies looking at water seeping through dead stumps. So if you just chop down a tree, what happens? And uh, what I'm going to actually spend a fair amount of time now talking about is basically tree root characterization. So yes, this is a 3D image. Uh, where we've gone through and slowly excavated the soil around a tree root structure. And we've got three different trees. We've got uh, two cottonwoods that are, I'll say, sister tree. No, sorry, not cottonwoods. These are valley oaks. And then the yellow one coming through is a cottonwood. And one of the morals of the story is, well, we'll hold off on that. So let's dive in a little bit with what the Corps of Engineers is interested in. Here's levee failure in California that was actually associated with uh, what they believe is rodent burrows. But the um, Corps of Engineers, they uh, believe that uh, tree roots can act as water conduits for piping to have water uh, flow through the um, levee. And this particular levee looks like the tree um, caused the failure, but instead this ended up being a overfilling bathtub. The levee filled up toppled over and spilled over, eroded down, and it ended up stopping at this particular uh, point here. Here's their schematic model. You've got two trees, you've got the root structures, and then the water could go ahead and work its way through. So this area that I'm studying, this is Parkfield. What we're going to do is we're going to fly up the San Andreas Fault. San Andreas Fault's coming up through here, and we're going to come into the uh, Sacramento. So Lake Tahoe is right up there, San Francisco. The home of the Giants is right behind us. And so in conjunction with UC Davis, um, Professor Allison Berry, we excavated these two valley oak trees. This was one summer, this was the following summer. And here's what that looks like. Here's what the, the pre-excavation, uh, pre we went out, collected ground-based LIDAR then, and it came back after the excavation, and you can see what the tree roots start looking like. I used um, two different scanners on this project. One was an Optech, uh, actually two different Optechs, and a Leica station here. And so now let's take a look at what the data look like. Um, this tree was actually not on a levee. I took it the digital um, artistic license to plop it on the center of the levee. This is actually one of our control trees growing in a very flat area uh, just south of UC Davis. With this animation, the top of the tree is going to go forward, and we're going to see the root system come up underneath us. You'll notice the root structure is very radial. You've got even-sized roots heading out in all directions. That's more evident right here. So all I've done is chopped off the top of the tree. Now we're able to look at the bottom. And what you see is very I mean, roots heading out, uniform size, not a lot of taper, where they go from very thick to very thin. Why is that important? We'll see in a moment. Now what I'd like to do is we're going to switch modes, still with the 3D glasses. And now we're able to look at surface texture. And this is effectively a three-dimensional digital elevation model, shaded relief map. You're going to see some very faint spots here. These are actually um, uh, the, the levee surface itself where I downsampled so we look through it. And here's the first cottonwood. You know, some very strong lateral roots that are actually parallel to the levee. 
completely different pattern than what we were seeing before. The other thing we're going to notice is that the tree roots stay fairly close in with, within under the tree. They're kind of within the drip area of the tree. The tree roots do not penetrate deep into the levee. On the uphill side, they only go down about two decimeters. And on the downhill side, uh, they, don't, I, they would go what you'd normally expect. Now I'm going to switch to colors. So the blue tree is the near cotton, uh, is the oak that's close to us, and this yellow is a cottonwood. And this cottonwood tree is about 20 meters away. And its, its root system goes in, through, and penetrates the levee all the way through the slurry wall, slurry wall and into the other side. We found that on the levees that the oak trees had very dominant um, pseudo tap roots. Oak trees normally don't have tap roots, so we call them pseudo tap roots. They basically go down a lot deeper than we had anticipated. The yellow, again, is the cottonwood. This one's uh, uh, from a tree that's right nearby. This one that goes up and penetrates levee is uh, from a cottonwood tree that's about 45 meters away. See, here's the levee surface through here. This tree, it's located up a little bit higher on the steeper part of the, um, the levee slope. It has really strong lateral roots with very high taper. It means it's in a high inner, or it's in a high stress environment. With this one here, it's just a little bit further away, less flat, I mean, a little flatter to topography, and the roots are very much well behaved. So what we're able to do with the tree roots, and this is an animation, but go ahead and take the glasses off. We're able to go ahead and take the tree and we're able to take the point cloud and break it down to smaller and smaller elements. So the, the brown here is the core, it's uh, the trunk. We've got green that comes out are the roots. But you can actually see I've got different lines in the center. I've vectorized it. I've collapsed the point cloud. I've used a, a piping tool in a software called Polyworks to basically find the, the, the center of the tree root. And then from there, you're able to go out and do all sorts of new new things, being able to look at um, the branching, the taper as a function of diameter. As we've got uh, branching, root volume at depth. We also uh, have GPS data on this, so we're able to go ahead and take a look at how much, I mean, what are the roots as a function of the solar production. You're going to have more roots on the south side of the tree in the northern hemisphere, because that's where they get more sun. And then for the engineering, some of the computer modeling, we're able to go ahead and start um, look, coming up with characteristic models of here's what a tree looks like on a levee, shallow levee, a shallow slope, steep slope, and start doing more extensive regional modeling. So we're able to take the small scale and work it up. So in my presentation, I've got, um, we just covered earth with the earthquakes. Um, this section here is going to be, I'll just call my water and wind, because uh, one of the big concerns is having the wind fall down, uh, wind fall downs. And I'm also going to be covering fire and ice a little bit later. But one of our big concerns through here uh, that we found is that mammal burrows. This is where we put grout in uh, mammal burrows on a levee, excavated the levee. And this is a random spot that we located where we actually had a mammal burrow ground squirrel that dug all the way from the land side in through the water side. So we've effectively lowered the levee. So this is the levee crown here. We got color scale on this side through here. This depth right here is the yellow. Is That's 50 centimeters, just shy of what? Um, 18 inches, and that's just to zoom in through here. So if this levee filled up right here, it would basically have piping coming in and contribute this uh, directly to levee failure. So why is this important? We have levees everywhere. Every state has levees, and I, Cali Northern California has 1,700 miles alone of levees, and with the Corps of Engineers wanting to chop down every tree, it's roughly costing $22,000 a tree to go ahead and remove trees and then rebuild the levees afterwards. So it's a very expensive regulation. To date, there's not been a single confirmed documented case of a levee failure associated with a tree. There have been, I'm going to say now, five levee failures in the United States, with the most recent one being uh, three weeks ago in, in Utah, directly associated with mammal burrows. So it's, an, it's a national issue, and with Katrina and now Sandy, it's uh, big issues that we've got to uh, deal with. So now I'm going to go ahead and switch to um, the next section. So this, and we will move from uh, California, and we're going to head up and take a look at the Bering Glacier. So this is the ice component of my talk. I, I guess on a side note, um, as we leave 
um, California, Oregon, Washington. We just had a fairly large magnitude 7.7 .7 earthquake off the shore of British Columbia that uh, did cause a tsunami uh, Sunday. Actually, Saturday night into Sunday morning. So why study the Bering Glacier? Approximately every 10 years, this glacier goes through a surge where it actually moves forward at a very high rate. And what I mean by a high rate is typically during the summer, the Bering Glacier may move one meter a day. Uh, using satellite imagery, we're able to, uh, we tracked it moving 60 meters a day. And what happens is about every 10 years, there's a lake that builds up underneath the Bering Glacier through here. It starts, the glacier starts floating, and that works its way back up the glacier. You remove the, the normal stress from it, and the whole thing surges down until the, the dam that caused the lake is eroded away, and then the glacier settles back down. So we went out. We um, got this, one of the bulges of the surge coming through here. This instrument um, I had designed up at Optech. It's, uh, it's, the, it's their instrument's called the LR. It's more importantly, it's at the one micron wavelength. It's, the energy is not attenuated as much by water and ice. So I'm able to get longer distances on those type of targets than I can with uh, my traditional target. And the, I, with my traditional scanner, 1,400 nanometers, 800 nanometers, those wavelengths, water really attenuates, absorbs the energy. But right around 1,000 uh, nanometers, we're able to actually get signal off it. So from here out to there is about a kilometer, and I was getting signal out onto the ice flow from here. Did a lot of work with helicopters, designed a new uh, infrared target to look and track at changes. Because this view here is actually from Grindle Hill, which is right up here. But the spot that I'm gonna focus my talk on is actually down at the Tashish Arm of the uh, Bering Glacier. Uh, here's um, the front of it. That little red dot there is a um, five foot five um, person for scale. Uh, so we were up there, now we're down there. Here's a scanner, I had two scanners where I basically started collecting data. Um, uh, we had one scan that was going every 30 minutes, another one that was every 15 minutes, getting the full front uh, of this uh, part of the Tashi Charm. So some of the questions that we had here is, what is the landward velocity of this glacier? We knew that it was surging and it was coming to the end of it. Is the motion steady state or episodic? And does the velocity vary across the flow front? This is all new questions that we could not have addressed with any other technology. This is how glaciologists up until last summer have collected velocities in front of glaciers um, on the ground, other than a satellite radar. See, these, these, this is PVC pipes put in. That's um, two meters apart. And I've got a couple up on some ice here just to try and track the ice. So they basically put the stakes up and allow the glacier to run over them. They count the number of stakes that fall over, and they're able to get their um, velocity. Here's another profile. Coming up through here, I want to take a look at rotation on here. So as for scale, there's a helicopter. My next um, slide will be an animation from about this perspective. And that helicopter, you'll actually see when the glasses disappears right down here. What I've done is I've taken two different time, I t the two different colors. The blue is the most recent time period. The yellow is the original data. And so what we're able to do is start looking at offsets within this data set. So with the motion, the helicopter's right down there. Here's people for scale. The area in the foreground where you have both the yellow and the blue, that's where I aligned onto. And you can see the data is, is um, perfectly intermingled. We don't have one color uh, on top or below the other. Here's some of the uh, stakes. The reason I use PVC pipe is it's infrared bright. So I could actually see PVC pipe from a long distance. As we head into the glacier, we're gonna actually see a uh, PVC pipe that was in here. Here's a PVC pipe, and this is where it was on day one, and that's on uh, day three where it overran it. Uh, overran the first one, and was uh, knocking on the door on the second one. Again, this is infrared um, albedo, and the areas that are dark we um, use water and it absorbed the energy. We got signal back. And the areas that are brighter are, clear, are drier. So you can see a drier front here. You can see the ice on top. And this is an area of very dry soil. And now we're going to look uh, sideways, perpendicular into it. And you can see where the yellow was and now where the blue came. So these are huge. That's like 30 meters, 40 meters tall chunk of ice coming at you. 
There are other spots where we're able to see backwards rotation where blocks fell backwards. I guess it would help if I put my glasses on. We'll come out and take a look at one of the other profiles. Here's one of the pro another profile. You can see the PVC pipe. You can actually see where the ice is knocking this one over at the time that we imaged it. And now we're going to go ahead and fly up to the top of the glacier. So previous to Grand Base LiDAR, it would be impossible to go in and make measurements like this. It's unsafe to actually go up there and say have GPS to be able to repeat to know that you're going back to the same spot. So we're effectively instantaneously able to go in and image multiple spots on this levee. You can see where this one out here, not on this levee, uh, on this ice flow. So when we're heading much higher up. Again, you can see some of the offsets features, we got that bright spot moved after that sprite. What I'm able to do is go in and identify unique features like that bright spot to that bright spot and just like what I did in Parkfield, be able to calculate it, the displacement field from that. So now we're looking straight down at it, we kind of have a sine wave coming in through here. Here's a couple hours worth of motion with it. So here's PVC pipe, you can see here's the front of the glacier where you've got the gap here and it's touching the wall. The next image I'm going to show is a difference plot, just like what I did with the Parkfield earthquake. The land at the front is held fixed, and so this is five hours worth of motion where we're seeing upwards of 20 centimeters moving towards us. Again, we're anticipating meters per hour, uh, but at this point here, the glacier had slowed down. Uh, this area here had actually moved back. It rotated back when we were there. What I've done is I've went in and took a, a look at this particular patch on the ice sheet, and from it, you're able to go ahead and measure unique displacements. So here we have 5.38 uh, meters uh, worth of displacement in 76 hours. You see all these small little planes on here? What I did is I took a, effectively a cylinder that's a decimeter across, aligned it with the piercing points, and then cut out all the data within that cylinder. And why would I do that? It's so that I could go ahead and do very detailed. We, within the ground based LiDAR data, we have a scatter. And what I want to do is uh, fit best fit planes to each one of these point clouds, and then be able to go ahead and measure the offset from there. And when I measure that offset, plot it in a cricket graph. So what we have here is time and hours from the beginning of the scan. So I have scan on day one, which we have yellow. And then the blue is my third day that I was out there um, collecting imagery. And did the exact same approach, exact same location. And this is displacements uh, in meters. What I was simply amazed with is that both days plot on the exact same line. What means is basically we started scanning around 9 o'clock in the morning, wrapped up around 3, 30, 4 o'clock in the afternoon. And the, the velocities on these separate days were identical down to 0.1 millimeters. This is uh, 4.17 uh, centimeters worth of displacement right here. So that's on the, the yellow and the blue, the same thing. Grand Base LiDAR has a, a scatter depending on what instrument you use, plus or minus four millimeters, plus, plus or minus three millimeters. What we found here was a rock steady velocity. So if we take this rock steady velocity from the days and then calculate what it should be for the whole 76 hour time period, we end up coming up with seven, no, sorry, 3.17 meters worth of displacement. We measured 5.38. So we've got very steady displacements during the day. What's going on at night? And that is, this is a new phenomenon that the glaciologists did not know about. They've just assumed that the, station, the glaciers were steady state. Got a colleague at, um, uh, uh, I'll just say within the USGS, but also uh, University of Michigan, that has GPS sites about four kilometers away from here. And he's only processed daily. He went back and had a graduate student process the uh, day versus night velocity, and he did in, in, indeed found that there was a difference between the daytime velocity and the nighttime velocity at the glacier, and this is about four kilometers up in the ice. So, the, so with our ground-based LIDAR, we're able to go ahead and re, uh, take a, a new look at how the glacier velocities work. And if we take a look at the long time period with the difference plot, we can see upwards of seven centimeters, uh, seven meters worth of displacement, which comes out to an average of 
uh, 171 centimeters a day if we take, uh, do an average throughout the whole area. Looking down at the glacier, each one of these points here is a velocity, so very much like what we did before where we did the um, hourly rates, we're able to calculate the velocities at a number of these different places. And so it is assumed that the glacier in the front velocity is for the most part moving like a bulldozer, just moving straight ahead. But what we found is this here is a ridge, see a small valley here, ridge. so basically you've got some small little ridges, valleys, with maybe a meter or so worth of throw. And what we're finding is that the velocities actually are converging into the lower areas and are spreading away from the ridges. So we're looking at some very dynamic flow velocities up in the very front. Uh, right here, you also have a different, a very advanced smiles. Here's the bulldozer where it's pushing everything forward. And here's where you've got, where we're overriding uh, the tops of the, the locations. The patterns that we found there were different than we found elsewhere. Uh, There's the Arrowhead Island not too far away. Uh, where we collected uh, data just after a rainy day. And we collected two different spots, one on landward, and then one was out here where the glacier went out, to the, um, out onto a small lake. And what we found is the landward velocities was significantly lower at two centimeters an hour. And where the, uh, the velocities out on the uh, lake worked out to be very similar. This 1.6 meters a day, the other one we saw 1.7 meters a day. So very similar velocities where uh, the, it's moving upward. One last uh, section that I want to talk, um, go with. Oops, you guys don't want to see that one yet. That's. I'm now going to take us down and take a look at Hawaii, uh, in particular Hale Mau Mau uh, Crater. Um, I was down uh, on Hawaii collecting data for a number of different projects, one of which is trying to look at radar property, I, lava flow properties as a function of um, time uh, as it would relate to um, satellite radar. But what I'm going to show you is a study where we had, I was asked to go ahead and collect data at Hale Mau Mau. This is the active volcanic vent. It's the crater that's right outside the Hawaiian Volcano Observatory. If anybody has been to the Big Island and up to the volcano, it's right next to the Jaeger Museum where you look out over and you could see the vent. And so as we come in, got the red being the different faults in the area. This is the, the main crater, and then we have the active lava lake right through here. Next, I'm going to show you a video that was collected about a week and a half ago. And here's the crater rim through here. This is the larger crater. This is the active lava lake. Uh, the white on the edges through here is sulfur. You've got different fumaroles where you've got gases that uh, precipitate that comes out. We ended up setting our scanner up right about here, collecting down into here. So the lava lake, um, what, this is the, the, from all of our reference slides, we have lava is actually coming up here, the magma's coming up, it's coming across here, and then it's going down at this location right through here. I have some animation, actually video showing um, how fast it's moving and what it actually looks like. So we set up here and scanned. And our scientific questions were actually quite simple. One, how well could the laser scanner image and penetrate through the volcanic glasses? Again, I used the um, Optex LR. Um, when I took it up to Alaska, it had some uh, technology issues. They gave me a new version um, that was significantly better. I was able to penetrate the volcanic gases when we couldn't actually even see the bottom of the crater. Uh, we had to get certified and um, to where um, respirators, which we use quite frequently when we're out there because of the volcanic glasses. On this particular day, the only way that I could see the bottom of the crater was actually having an IR filter on my a digital camera. And it gives you a sense of what it looked like through there. We went back the following morning and collected data, and here's what the, uh, the crater looked like. And you're able to see, here's the active flows through here. Long short, most of the time, the laser did not give us much penetration off the actual fractures. They're 2,000 degrees. Uh, the area's right around about 1,000 degrees. We're able to actually do a fairly good job of imaging a lot of those structures, uh, with, assuming the gas was not too dense. You can go ahead and put on your 3D glasses here. They're not, nece not necessary, but uh, this was actually done with a handheld 3D uh, video camera. 
and you can see the scanner. To give you a perspective of what the scanner is seeing, so this is on the rim. It's about 80 meters down to here, and another 60 meters down to the bottom through here. And so there's the lav lake. Uh, this was the morning where we could actually see down. Other times we could not see. It, the cliff drops off really steep. So this is the environment that we were working in. And now let's take a look at what the data actually looked like that we collected. So this, go ahead and keep the 3D glasses on. For those who have been uh, out there, this is the Jaeger Museum, it's located right about here. We're looking at, out to Halimama right through there. So as we fly through the rim of the crater, all of our scans were set up on the other side. Infrared bright, so these areas through here is where we have a lot of sulfur in the rocks. You can see where you had some fumaroles, then landslides carrying some of the rocks down. Uh, you can see some of the different geologic uh, rock layers within here. When we start seeing yellow coming up, we're actually looking at the lava lake itself. We have some faults and fractures through here that we're gonna um, start mapping, because we can't go down there, it's off limits to go down there, but by using remote sensing with the point cloud data, um, I've got on the order out here, probably about two centimeter, one centimeter spot spacing. Now we're going down underneath, and we're looking at one of the big hazards here. Not to say an active volcano is not a hazard, but you can see this right here, this is overhung. That's about uh, 35, 40 meters back to right here. So you've got a lot of rock, and every now and then chunks of this fall off into the lava lake. And it's very much like dropping a, a mento into a Diet Coke. It erupts. And what you can see is we scan different times, and you can see different layers through here. And that's what I want to talk about next, are these different layers. And what, what the layers are is basically different level, levels of the lava lake over an 18-hour time period. As we come up higher, you can see kind of the land surf, I, uh, a former crater. These spots right here are fences. The USGS, we've got our, um, a lot of our webcams are there that you can take a look at. This is where I had the instrument set up. The point clouds in the air here are some of the dense smoke of which we're imaging off of. And so now we're looking back over the crater in this direction. So I said that I wanted to go ahead and take a look at the lava lake itself. And what I've done is I've taken this out as a, a, a series of profiles heading across the lake. So this is a horizontal distance in meters across. This is height below the upper rim of the crater. And the black data set that I have here is time zero. As I fill in each of the additional timestamps, uh, the timeline here is going to go ahead and fill in. This is not in 3D. One of these times I've got to turn these into some 3D plots. So in the first um, scan, which was about a half an hour long, it dropped down 4.6 meters at a rate of um, three, uh, 0.65 meters per hour. It continued dropping. So within an hour and a half of scanning, it dropped down and it ended up bottoming out here. And then it slowly started rising up. So we see the numbers up here. So any of the warmer colors are where it's lifting up, the cooler colors are where it's dropping down. In a very short time period, it rose uh, three quarters of a meter. We did some scanning elsewhere and then came back and we found that it raised another three meters. And within a matter of a half an hour, another uh, meter worth of uplift. We came back the following morning and it uh, went up another total of 10 meters at an average rate of just over a half meter per hour. So the total, okay, and then after it came up, it ended up dropping down a little bit when we were up there. And I'm going to show you this on a different plot coming up. So the maximum throw with this was basically close to 16 meters, uh, 5.8, with an average um, fill rate here of point. Uh, 82 meters. The USGS, we've got a number of different sensors scattered throughout um, Hale Mau Mau area, or actually throughout the Hawaii Volcano Observatory, Hawaii. What we're looking at here is a tilt meter. The units on the left are micro radians. So imagine a steel rod that is one kilometer long, and you push one end down of it one millimeter. That's a micro radian. And so the units here, that's one microradian through there. There's uh, minus one microradian there. 
So this instrument is very sensitive. We're measuring very subtle tilts. And Halley Malmout goes through what we call DI events, deflation, inflation events. The pattern that we're looking at here goes on all the time. It, 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 what you've got is back of it that comes into the main chamber, inflates, then it starts deflating, and it fills up Puo, which is out halfway out to the ocean, and that feeds lava tube that heads out uh, to the flow field and, and into the ocean when it goes. What you also notice on here is what they call some pistoning events, where it comes up and it drops down really quick and then rises back up. Got some pistoning events here and then some through here. What we've ended up capturing with the ground-based LIDAR, so this is the ground-based LIDAR. This is just elevation below the summit, so we've got two different axes here, but the time's the same. We captured the very bottom part of one of these DI events, where it was dropping down, it bottomed out, and started rising up. We caught a couple mid-time spans, and then we caught one of these small little um, pistoning events up near the top, right up through here. So now what I want to do is do something I've never done before. We're going to actually go live with the LiDAR data, because I want to do a couple things that I have not tried. Right, the couple things I want to show you. So this is the, one of the software packages that I use. It's created. Um, I'm an adjunct faculty at UC Davis, and this is uh, being developed by the Keck Caves, which is at UC Davis. So we're going to go ahead and fly through this data set. And the, the path that we're seeing, actually, let me pause for a second. I'm going to slide this out so we can see the couple talking points I want to show. This is the, the surface of the lava lake. What we saw in the video, there's topography on the lava lake. And these are some of the ripples there. So imagine if you have carpet on a smooth floor and then you move the floor or the, on the conveyor belt. What's going to happen is the top is going to start ri rippling up. And that's exactly what we're seeing through here. These are the, just the ridges. So the flow direction is going from this side, actually going from this side, off into that side. Some of these chasm, some of these darker cracks are some of the areas where uh, we had the spreading. So those are the areas that were glowing on the previous ones. So now let me go ahead and animate this. And so now we're going to come through, take a closer look at some of the topography. Some of the topography here is on the order of a meter worth of elevation change or height change. Can have a ridge coming through here, like that could have been a separating zone. Sorry for the path in here. It's software that I use to do the animations. Now, what I want to do is start pointing out there's a lot of different ridges in here. And these ridges, actually, I'm going to pause. Actually. I'm going to pause right up here, and now we're going to actually look at the data a bit. See these ridges where this is the surface? Unfortunately, I've got it tilted right now. Um, the laser scanner is going from this side, scanning over this way. And what we're seeing are horizontal ridges going across the lake that are on the order of a decimeter in height. And this is something that when I first looked at, I thought it was wind in the data set. But I'd expect this to go, I mean, if it was truly wind, I'd expect it to be on the land surface as well. It was not. It was only on the lava lake itself. And so what could be causing these type of ridges on the lake? If I go ahead and put kind of a hill shading on it like we have with, um, uh, with uh, geologic maps, you see these ridges go extend all the way across the lava lake. So what we're seeing is actually the rise and the fall of the lava lake. And I know my time's getting short, so I'm going to head back. These are, this is a profile heading across. We we're able to see the uplift. And sm so basically, these are the ridges that we're setting, heading across the lava lakes. The problem is, this was collected in space. And what we want to do is understand what's the frequency of the lava lake moving up and down. And so I was able to go ahead. I knew the scan parameters, create a synthetic uh, tricopied LIDAR data set, and then create a transfer function to go ahead and move it into time. So this is seconds from the beginning of the scan to the end of the scan. 
And with that, I'm able to go ahead and run it through a power spectrum to find out what the common frequency is. And so what this here is time in the horizontal axis, and this is the higher the, the spikes are here, the more dominant that wavelength is. So what I'm trying to figure out is how often are these? Ultimately, what's the mechanism driving the lake with this micropistoning where it's rising and falling about a decimeter? And what we found, or what I found is basically at the very, at the one second range, uh, the spike there is, I think, associated with topography and spatial aliasing. This is the big one. It's rising and falling roughly a decimeter every 8.4 seconds. And we have secondary, uh, okay. We've got a secondary frequency at these spikes here that are plus or minus uh, three uh, seconds. So I've got a video that I created last night. This was um, looking at the lava lake where I've got two times speed, four times, and eight times speed. And what I want you to do is look at what's going on with the lava lake itself. You can slowly see it rise and fall. So this is something they had not looked at, my colleagues at the Hawaiian Volcano Observatory. They had not noticed it until my data set came through. So I'm going to speed this up to four, uh, four times, where you can actually start seeing more motion. And then when we go to eight seconds, it's roughly, we should get about one cycle every second. And so you really get a sense for what's going on with that. I'm going to skip over the next animation. It's a very large, high def video. Here we go. And let's come to this one right here. This is what Heli Mau Mau looked like last week. It was actually at a near record high level. The last time it was up at this level here, we had a major fissure eruption out in the, the flanks that, um, that's where you had the classic fire fountain that came out. So this is the overhang that we saw here, and it is almost completely filled up. The starting Saturday, this is the tilt meter here, it's finally started deflating, so we're actually out of a hazard uh, condition. But we really thought that this was gonna ultimately lead to having a uh, failure. I'm gonna quickly go through a couple slides just to get to the last one. Uh, I'm using ground-based LiDAR on a lot of different applications. Tectonics, there are numerous ones. We've got debris flow hazards. This is a rock fall in Yosemite National Park. We're able to calculate the volume. Uh, floods, landslides, debris flows. Done work um, on Mount Rainier with more glacier work. Uh, Tioga Pass avalanche work. Chile, looking at snowpack change, landslides, debris failures, caves, do a lot of technology development. So I want to go ahead and end here. This is um, what we started the, the conference off with, is what this meeting's set up to do. And we're going to focus on the evolution, the revolution that we are currently um, in right now. I say I've got a couple of challenges or something, things that we have to think about. We, as scientists and as a user community, needs to stop thinking in 2D. Our data sets are three-dimensional. What do we do with it? Most geologists take it, we want bare earth, and they go back to using their 2D tools to analyze three-dimensional data. We need to get beyond that. That's also taking the point cloud, the three-dimensional data, reducing it down. The point cloud data has got so much wealth of information. Nobody's really using the intensity in the ground base, or in the airborne light, or ground base, IFSAR. There's a lot of information on structural properties and um, that we're able to work with. And Areas that I'd like to see or I'm looking forward to in the next five, 10 years is going to be flash LIDAR or technologies that allow us to go ahead and make snapshots. So if we think back to Halley Mau Mau, where the lava lake rising and falling, if we're able to take unique snapshots, I'm able to address even more scientific questions, like glacier motion, because within the time series, all those ridges, by its uh, flash LIDAR or some other equivalent technology, I'd be able to measure the whole la uh, lake at one time and watch its time series move. Thank you. That concludes the session. I want to welcome everybody to the exhibit hall where they're serving refreshments and the technical sessions start about 2.15. Thank you very much.